The Tomb Kings are probably the most versatile undead faction in Total War Warhammer 2. Unlike the Vampire Counts who have a lack of ranged options, the Vampire Coasts which have amazing firepower but poor mobility, the Tomb Kings offer a well-rounded military with troops that do not appear to really excel at any one thing but have all their bases covered. The exception to this would be their magical machines like the Tomb Scorpion or War Sphinx that really make the faction shine. The lore behind the Tomb Kings is very interesting and I'll provide a summary of how they came about. The spoilers here are very minor, but should you wish to continue on without knowing anything, skip ahead. The Tomb Kings are what remains of the ancient civilization of Neokara. They had many different cities, and each city was devoted to the worship of a particular god. Every city was ruled by a different king. These people were very devout, and royalty would always give their firstborn son over to the gods by making them a grand hierophant while the second-born son would go on to become king. It was this gesture of giving the firstborn over to the gods that showed their extreme reverence to them. The Neocarans were blessed with lifespans far longer than normal humans, often living to be several hundred years old. The Neocarans gave birth to the first necromancer, Nagash. Nagash was the firstborn son of the city of Khemri, the Neocaran capital while his younger brother Thutep was made king. Thutep was a kind ruler, but ultimately a weak king, and the great foundation left behind by Setra the Imperishable, who had united Neokara through military supremacy and bloodshed, and made Khemri the centre of the empire, was beginning to erode. Nagash was anything but weak though. He scorned the gods, and he exploited his position as Grand Hierophant for influence and power alone. He reasoned that the only power the gods had over men was punishment in the afterlife should they not worship them. So he sought out ways to extend his life so that he would never die and never be judged. Nagash learned dark sorcery from some captive dark elves and began weaving magical disasters upon the city's populace and carefully engineering it to look like it was the fault of Thutep's lousy rulership. Through these methods, he was able to erode public support for his brother. After some time, he was able to supplant him. Nagash's rule in Khemri was incredibly controversial because it went against everything the Neokarans believed in. He was dubbed Nagash the Usurper. After a few decades, the other cities, save for a couple that had aligned themselves with Nagash, joined forces and tried to overthrow him. Unfortunately for them, Nagash had already mastered necromancy and concocted an elixir that would provide him and his cabal immortality. These men became known as Nagash's Immortals. The first and most infamous of the Immortals was Arkhan the Black, and he was Nagash's most capable and trusted servant. Although not at the level of Nagash, the Immortals were capable of dark sorcery and necromancy as well, and Arkhan was a very good necromancer in his own right. The cities failed to defeat Nagash's undead armies, and he went on to rule Neokara with an iron fist for a very long time. Eventually he was overthrown, but not before severing the link between the Neokarans and their gods. They were made mere mortals now, and no longer had the longevity of their ancestors, and their gods would no longer heed their prayers. Most of the immortals were beheaded, but Arkhan the Black was captured in secret and taken to Lamia, where its rulers attempted to recreate Nagash's rituals and use the power for themselves. Arkhan was forced to help, but they were unable to create anything that approached Nagash's elixirs. Despite their inexperience, they were able to create an elixir that would extend their lifespans. Lamia's queen, Neferata, was made into the first vampire with Arkhan's help. And this is the origin of the other vampires in the Warhammer universe. Nagash was thought to be dead, but he was not. Nagash had headed north to bide his time and regroup, and he built the terrifying fortress of Nagashazar. To cut a very long story short, Nagash returned to Neokara and resurrected Arkhan the Black. Neokara was yet again thrown into chaos and ruin by Nagash, and he ruled Neokara once more. Nagash was not satisfied though, he wanted to rule the world. He conducted a terrible ritual that should have resurrected all the dead in the world under his control, 
but he was interrupted by an assassin. Instead of resurrecting all the world's undead, it killed all the living Neokarans and resurrected them, including the long dead Neokarans like Cetra the Imperishable as the Tomb Kings. The playable factions for the Tomb Kings are Camry, which is ruled by Cetra the Imperishable, the Exiles of Neek, which are ruled by Grand Hierophant Kartep, the Baris, which is ruled by Queen Kalida, and the best one, the Followers of Nagash, led by Arkan the Black, which will be the focus of this video. The Followers of Nagash have all the Tomb King units, but they also get some Vampire Count units to play with. They're also led by the infamous Arkan the Black, who was the first and most capable of the original Immortals. The only weird thing is that his teeth are white. Arkan's namesake comes from his blackened teeth, which is supposed to be stained completely black due to years of consumption of the black lotus root, which was a drug used in ancient Neokara. So I'm not sure why they made his teeth white, it seems like a strange detail to overlook. The Tomb Kings play quite differently to the other undead factions. The units do not cost any money to recruit, only time, and they also have no upkeep costs. This sounds overpowered until you learn that they've got a heavy restriction on lords. While the other factions can recruit as many lords as they can sustain the upkeep for, the Tomb Kings have a limit on how many lords they can have active at any one time. This limit is raised by researching new dynasties or by a costly ritual in the Mortuary Cult. There's five dynasties to unlock, and to get additional armies beyond that, you'll have to use the expensive Mortuary Cult ritual. It starts as expensive yet affordable, but becomes more and more expensive as you keep repeating it. For me, what this means is I always feel like I don't have enough lords while I'm playing as the Tomb Kings. The Mortuary Cult is one of the most interesting aspects of the faction. Organs and stuff can be harvested after the battles and used as a resource. This is a type of rare currency used by the Mortuary Cult to do a great many things. The first is unlocking more lord slots, but it can also be used to craft items and to unlock renowned units, which are special versions of standard units. The more trade resources you have in your empire, the more kinds of items unlock to be crafted, but it's everything from weapons and armor to scrolls and potions. The organs can also be spent to unlock special lords in the research tree. There is one of these lords per dynasty. Most of them I do not recognize because I'm a bit of a Warhammer noob, but there are some, like Thutep, that I do recognize. Thutep is Nagash's younger brother. They offer special benefits that are consistent with their history, like Thutep increases trade income. This makes sense because his strength as a ruler was establishing trade with the other cities. Because the Tomb King units are free to recruit and cost no upkeep, they're instead limited by slots. You can only have as many of each type of unit as your infrastructure can support. For example, building a barrow will give you access to 4 ghouls, 4 bats and 4 wolves. Building 2 will then increase this to 8, and so on. The lords of the Tomb King armies are the Tomb Kings. The kings are strong in melee combat and can also be upgraded to ride a war sphinx of their own. For heroes you've got the Lich Priests. These guys are mortuary cultists and a type of lesser hierophant. They're powerful wizards and very useful to have in armies. They're also good at removing corruption from your provinces, among other things. The Tomb Princes are the sons of the Tomb Kings. They're the assassin unit of the faction. In combat they're a melee specialist and on the campaign map they can be used to assassinate, assault the garrison of settlements and more. The Necrotechs are the great architects and are pretty useful assistants to armies. They increase the mobility of an army, which is always useful, as well as being tough customers in combat. They can also be used to block enemy armies, damage enemy walls, discover Skaven undercities, and more. The unique vampire count units available to the followers of Nagash are bats, which are good for air defense and picking off fleeing enemies or harassing enemy archers and artillery. Dire wolves, which are extremely fast and very good at killing archers but suck against everything else. Crypt ghouls, which deal poison damage and move very quickly compared to the skeletons, but are weak against armored units. And finally the wonderful hex wraiths, 
which are extremely strong ghostly cavalry. Of all these vampire count units available, I got the most value out of the hex wraiths and the crypt ghouls. The bats and wolves usually feel like you wasted an army slot, especially since recruitment costs nothing for the tomb kings. It's not like the other factions where maybe you're broke, so you think, well shit, I can't afford skeletons so I may as well get some bats, because they're cheap. Although, in situations where you have multiple armies in a battle, I find an army that's got 10 bats in it can be very useful. 10 bats are enough to cause some serious mayhem behind enemy lines, while the other armies contribute to the bulk of the fighting force, but you are still sacrificing 10 slots that could have been more powerful units. So I still feel that it's very situational. The other issue is that the Tomb King faction has its own flying unit called the Carrion, which are like vultures. There's fewer of these in a unit than there are bats, but they're individually stronger. Honestly, I can't really say which of them is better. There may be some strange situation where bats are preferable to Carrion, or vice versa, but I couldn't tell you what that situation would be. As for the wolves, I find them to be a very disappointing unit in general, and I never make use of them with any of the undead factions. Bats or Carrion are slower, and probably weaker, but they're also flying, which makes them way more useful. As I said before, the Tomb Kings have a very well-rounded army. For infantry, they've got skeleton swordsmen and spearmen. Each of these units perform very well at their jobs, and I've got no complaints about either one. Later on you can get Neokaran warriors, which dual wield Kopishes in a better in most ways than normal swordsmen, especially where DPS is concerned. The elite infantry are the Tomb Guard, which look pretty cool and come in two kinds, sword and shield or halberd and shield. If you can get these, they're always going to be better than standard swordsmen and spearmen. Finally you've got skeleton archers. The archers are very good and always remain useful even towards the late game when spearmen and swordsmen have been replaced by the tomb guard. Sepulchral stalkers are a kind of monstrous infantry. They're large reptilian things that can spit venom at short range before closing in and being devastating against standard troops. The tomb kings have a lot of cavalry options. At the most basic level they have skeleton horsemen with swords, but they also have horse archers, which are great skirmishes. On top of that they've also got chariots, which come in the form of melee chariots, but also bow chariots. The chariots have the advantage of being much more devastating to infantry than standard cavalry are. I've read stuff online about people not liking chariots much, and finding that they perform badly, but in my experience they seem to be very effective, and have consistently very high kills in battles. You do have to be pretty active with them though, making sure to keep them on the move and slamming into the enemy over and over again, but the same can be said for cavalry, so I'm not really sure why people are complaining about them. Maybe it's a problem that only comes in multiplayer against other humans. I like the chariot archers the most because they can shoot and harass until they're out of ammunition, and then they can be used like melee chariots to swing around and smash into flanks or run over archers and enemy artillery. One of the best cavalry units available is the Hexwraith, these guys never underperform in any battle, and they also strike fear into the hearts of the enemy. Even better than the Hex Wraiths though are the Necropolis Knights. They're guys that ride giant cobras, and they're just really devastating against all kinds of units. They're a bit like a marriage between cavalry and monstrous infantry. The Tomb Kings also have some artillery options. They've got the Screaming Skull Catapult, which hurls magical exploding skulls at the enemy. These catapults are actually used by Nagash in the Ancient Wars to great effect. They are outranged by enemy cannons, but the storm of dark magic they produce compensates well for the reduced range. They also have the Casket of Souls. It shoots multiple beams of green blob-like projectiles at enemies that explode. Although a very cool unit, I actually prefer the Screaming Skull catapults. Finally, we come to the Magical Constructs. The strongest part of the Tomb King armies are their constructs, made of stone and sometimes bone, and held together with magical energies. The first of these are the Ushabti, which are a kind of monstrous infantry. In ancient Neokara, the Ushabti were the elite king's guard, sworn to protect him. They feared nothing, and were large in stature, 
and mutated in monstrous ways, reflecting the aspect of the god and the king's city. That's why here you can see them with crocodile skulls, hawk skulls, jackal skulls, etc. I don't know what the crocodile is, but the jackal is probably meant to be an upshabti of Jaff, the god of death. And the hawk-faced ones are probably meant to be Petra, the overlord or lord of gods. I say probably because I'm a noob when it comes to Warhammer lore. I know a bit, but not too much about it. Anyway, they're extremely good in combat. They're great for focusing on and killing enemy heroes and for destroying infantry. They're very strong units in general. They also come in the form of bowmen that shoot very large bows that seem to have projectiles that break up into some kind of scatter shot. They're also great skirmishers because they have a very long stride and can outrun everything aside of cavalry and large monster units. The Tomb Scorpion is a great unit. It's a vanguard unit, so it can be deployed close to the enemy, and it's incredibly destructive against enemy troops. It has really good survivability. It does a lot of damage, but seems to be more of a tank than a damage dealer. I like to use it to keep an enemy preoccupied. It's a kind of set and forget unit. The only time you got to be careful with them is, of course, against units like Dwarf and Giant Slayers. They're great at killing big stuff. The Bone Golem is a huge bowman of a huge bow. It shoots some kind of magical arrow and it does a lot of damage. You could think of him as being a bit like a ballista, except when he runs out of arrows he can stomp and smash enemies. He's a strong unit, but ranged is certainly his specialty, and he doesn't perform as well in melee as you might expect. The Cambrian War Sphinx is an awesome unit, a giant cat that just obliterates enemy infantry. They're great against everything except anti-giant specialists like those damned Warven Giant Slayers. The Necro Sphinx is a large anti-monster construct. Make sure you use him against enemy monsters, because he performs quite badly against infantry. I was able to defeat one of these in a battle against Camry with only a handful of basic spearmen units. He took quite a long time to die, but the spearmen handled him with ease. Finally we have the Hyro Titan. It's a giant man with laser eyes. He can also stomp enemies with his feet and blast them with his fiery gaze. He's also got some spells. In conclusion, I really like the Tomb Kings. The ancient Egyptian theme is really cool, and they're also very important to the necromancy lore of Warhammer. They're also the only undead that aren't a type of vampire faction, which means not all of them are evil either, which is quite nice. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. I've got more videos on necromancy stuff coming soon.